right. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We got a room full almost, so that's good to see. And how many people online? <clears throat> The test for Bill. <laughs> 46. 46 people online, yeah, right. so that's, that's pretty good. Um, so I'm Could someone that's online give me a thumbs up if he's getting volume? <laughs> that's okay. Um, so yeah. for those that don't know me, I'm Shana. I'm the Disaster Program Manager for the Red Cross for Southeast Wisconsin. So I've been with the Red Cross over 10 years, uh, here in Milwaukee uh, almost six years. Uh, really happy to have everybody here to talk about an important topic. It is the last day of Black History Month, um, and we are going to focus on black mental health today. Uh, the reason that this is important, why is it required? Why did I need to be here? Why did I need to show up? I know people drove in from um, uh, Washington County, Dodge County. Uh, many people are tuned in online, and I think the reason that it's important is because every day, we see clients in precarious situations. A lot of our clients are black and brown people. And it's really important that as responders, as the people that are the face of the Red Cross, we're the face of hope, we're the face of help, we're the face of compassion. We're spending 12 hour shifts in, in situations with clients when we're working in shelters. We're meeting people on fire scenes when they've lost everything. And sometimes emotions can get high. We don't understand why people think the way that they do, why people do the things that they do. I get a lot of these questions. Why this? Why that? And it is a lot of times with our clients that are black and brown individuals. And it's incumbent upon us to be those folks that if we're going to do this as part of an organization that's committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, that we just don't use that as a statement, right? It's not just a statement of Red Cross. If that's going to be an organization we're going to be part of, then we're going to do the work to be better at what we do every day. We're all great. We serve our clients in a really great manner. We show up. We have a smile on our face. Um, we're ready to help as best we can. But it's really important to understand where um, our, a lot of the clients that we are faced with, where they're coming from, uh, what has transpired into history that may still affect people into present day. So that's what we're going to learn a little bit about today. This won't be the last conversation. <clears throat> we see many clients, uh, um, you know, different ages, lifestyles, ethnicities, that we're going to continue these conversations, keep them going so that we can be better, uh, uh, in a better place to serve people in a much better manner. Again, we interface with so many clients for such a long period of time, especially in recovery. The recovery process can go on for weeks, right? And it just can, Lisa, it, it goes on a long time. And you have to work with people and have to help coax them along. And the more we understand, the better we understand, the more education that we have, the better off we all are to serve. So with that, Curtis Marshall is our uh, guest speaker for today. Curtis is a DAP member recruited by Terrell uh, through our community response model. Um, really excited to have Curtis here to be able to present. He also brought along his wife, uh, who I do also want to recognize for her service to the city of Milwaukee. She is a retired OBGYN from Mount Sinai uh, over 30 years, and I think she deserves recognition uh, as an African-American woman uh, and a doctor here in the community. So thank you for coming. <laughs> um, so we'll invite Curtis up. He, he can more than introduce himself. <laughs> He's on the timer, but we appreciate all that Curtis has done. A lot of you have worked with Curtis on that calls, on shelter shifts. Uh, we appreciate his expertise. Uh, he has spent uh, uh, also a, a career uh, focused on health equity. And so uh, we invite him to come up and take us through a presentation today about black mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. <clears throat> First of all, I just want to start out and just say that I am totally in all and humble to be standing in front of you all today. Uh, I consider myself a new back in Red Falls. 
I've been in, I've worked with some of you all, you know, on responses and shelters, and and I've learned a lot. And, and I think that, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of years in this room, uh, of those of you, you know, of, of volunteers that have done phenomenal work. And I feel like I'm just in a, in a place of, uh, I'm just blessed tonight to be here in front of you all to talk about something that's very important to me. And as I talk about mental health and the whole history, going back to the 1700s, right? In transparency, I'm going to share some of my stories. And I'm sure, and I want you to understand and see why this topic is so important to me. Because I've been there. I mean, I've dealt with mental health. You know, I've dealt with stigma. Uh, and I've shared some of those experiences uh, in my life as I help, you know, as I've grown, matured, and I'm an old man, right? But still, I do have touch points in mental health. So I am a consumer of mental health services. I'm an advocate, and I'm passionate about telling my story, hoping that that will inspire others to move and you know and seek help you know when needed. But first of all, this is like the last day of Black History Month, right? And normally the last day of Black History is February 28th. But because we have a, a leap year, right? Then we're still celebrating, right? And normally when I talk about you know when I talk about Black History Month, I talk about a important event on that particular day. So tonight I have absolutely nothing to talk about as far as my history <laughs> happened February 29th because we've never had a February 29th. So again, so but because of that, I just want to share a little bit about black history and uh, and the, the origins and why it's important to celebrate and Bill, this is not moving forward. So what do we have to do here? So what's going on here? I'm sorry, Curtis, that should be under your control right now. That's your PowerPoint presentation. Yes, my PowerPoint. It's on the bottom row. We're moving forward online. It's moving forward around, but it's not moving forward here. Oh, here we go. Right here. Change the slides. There we go. There we go. Okay. So the theme for African American for Black History this month is African Americans in the arts. That's the theme, right? But again, when we celebrate, celebrate, celebrate Black History, right? We celebrate, you know, what African Americans have contributed to make this a better country for everyone. So this month we're celebrating the arts, uh, the arts as well as the how we contributed, you know, in education, in science in industry and in finance. So it's just not the arts, even though African Americans, we do have a strong presence in the arts, right? But we just celebrate everything in all aspects of how African Americans have contributed to make this a better uh, country for all of us. So, still not. Hmm. There we go. Okay, so the founder of Black History Month is Dr. Carter Gilman Wilson. So it began in February of 1926, but then uh, President uh, Ford, Gerald Ford, he established Black History as a month-long celebration in 1976. So he signed a proclamation that said, so the entire month of Black History should be celebrated, you know, for the entire month, and that began in 1976. So again, so it teaches the historical struggles, the accomplishments and achievements of African Americans in the United States, you know, going all the way back to Africa and beyond. So this is a principle that I love this principle. And I'm telling you why I love this principle, right? It's Ubuntu because it means like compassion, humanity, right? And that's what the Red Cross is all about. So Nelson Mandela said, the spirit of Ubuntu, that profound African sense that we are human only through the humanity of others, human beings. It's not a parochial, parochial phenomenon, but it's added mobility to our common search for a better world. And so doesn't that embrace what the Red Cross is about? The Red Cross is about humanity. So again, what we do as a Red Cross, you know, volunteers and staff, that's what we do. We show humanity. 
if you practice the principles of humanity, of which are respect, human dignity, compassion, solidarity, and consensus. So this is what Red Cross is all about. And then when you look at the, <coughs> at the principles of Red Cross, or the mission and vision, basically it's the same thing. That's what we do every day. So again, but we all stand in this room here, we all stand on the shoulders of individuals that came before us. Wait, starting back in the early you know, 1900s. Or even made going back to Frederick Douglass. He was an abolitionist, right? And he became friends with Clara Barton, the founder of the Red Cross, and discussed establishing a Red Cross shortly after the Civil War. Think about that. Think about that. Going back to the Civil War, like 1865, in the end, that's when discussions began about the Red Cross. And Frederick <laughs> Douglass, an abolitionist, was very involved in that. He even signed the original articles of the Red Cross. I didn't know that. I mean, that's just really, really impressive. An abolitionist signed the original articles to establish the Red Cross. Murray Bethune, an educator. She, delegated, she was delegated by President Roosevelt to attend the wartime conferences to discuss African-American representation in the Red Cross, which resulted in the establishment of the Committee on Red Cross Activities with respect to the Negro. So again, so we have individuals that have schools named after them, like Murray Bethune has a college, uh, the Murray Bethune College down south. It's a historical black college, right? So again, so we have individuals that are African American who are very involved in the Red Cross, the exception of the Red Cross, so that it could be inclusive of all populations, particularly African Americans. But we all know about the infamous Gwen Jackson, right? Her picture is out on the wall when I first came down here for, for a meeting. I just kind of walked around and looked at, you know, those on the wall. They really, you know, had major, you know, uh, a major impact on the Red Cross and the work that they do. And Gwen Jackson, even before I came to the Red Cross, right, I knew a little bit about Gwen Jackson, right? So she became a volunteer in 1961. She turned the Milwaukee Red Cross board. She was appointed to the National Volunteer Chair as the National Volunteer Chair in 1989 and the Board of Governors in 1992. In 1995. So right now, this chapter here, she currently holds the title of the Meritage Board Chair. Mm -hmm. And then doing further research about when she was involved in nonprofits and charitable organizations, not only here in Milwaukee, but across the country. Across the country. You know, there's a school, the 21st Street School in Milwaukee is now named the Gwen D. Gwen T. Jackson Elementary School. So again, so Think about that. Think about the shoulders that we stand on. We stand on some phenomenal shoulders, right? And I just researched right invisible a lot of phenomenal people, you know, volunteers that have come before us. <coughs> they really did lay the foundation and the cornerstone of the work that we do today. So I just want to kind of recognize, you know, like History Month and how, you know, others that have come before us. How they set the foundation and the cornerstone. And personally, for me, the more I read, the more motivated I am, and the more I'm committed to the Red Cross. Because someone that looks like me, that talks like me, that's from my community, has a major impact on what I do today and what you do as well. So tonight, we're here basically to talk about black mental health. Black women help, right? And so many times, when we hear that term in our families and our community, we don't want to talk about it, right? So it's just not black men or health. As Red Cross volunteers, we all have touch points with that. We all have touch points with when we respond. And you don't have to be African American, you know, to, to kind of be concerned about this. But everyone at some point is affected by men or health. Every culture has a perception of what mental health should be like, what it is, the stigma. Let's not talk about it. Let's avoid it, right? Now, I'm going to tell you why this became important to me as a DAC volunteer, right? I have yet, I have yet to have one person, when we do the assessment in that, 
I've yet to have one person say, yeah, I'm going to submit or have support. I'm going to talk to someone, right? And a story comes to mind when I think uh, Laura and I, Laura and I, we responded to a young man, right? He had lost everything. We were in his house, talking to him, right? He was at his dad's house, right? This was like the night after a fire. And we're sitting there talking to him, right? And this young man, he was at the point as if you would think that he just didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to do. And all he kept saying was that, he said, you know what? I came within seconds of losing my twin boys. Remember that? He was sitting in the chair, he said, just as he got them off the bed, the ceiling fell in. Just seconds. And he was sitting there, he said, all I have, all my boys got right now are the socks and diapers they had on when I got them in the nick of time. I mean, and he was traumatized. And then we got to the part about, well, we offered this, we offered that. And he said, no, I'm good. No. I don't need that. Mm -hmm. It was very obvious to me, to me, that he needed someone to talk to. He needed that support. But just like myself, years ago, and I shared that experience about myself, he said, no, I'm good. It was very obvious, very obvious that he was not good. So again, so <clears throat> that is what prompted me when Shane asked about, you know, what I could present on. I said, let's talk about mental health, the stigma. Because in my community, in my culture, the stigma is real. And it goes back, it goes back to the 1700s. It all began when the slaves first landed or brought to this country in the 1700s. That's where it all began. So again, so tonight, talk about the origins of mental health care for African Americans, uh, we know the changes over time, and at the end, I want us to engage in a, in a productive discussion about what we can do, or what we think we can do, or needs to be done to eliminate the stigma that has been carried on from generation to generation. So again, so history tells a very brief story of mental health care for African Americans, dating back to slavery, dating back to slavery. So much of the systemic racism that black slaves, you know, endured is carried forth, is carried forth, is carried forth. So even though it happened back in the 1700s, it's still <coughs> there today, it's still there today. So again, so I'm sure my story, my story. And um, my dad died many years ago, right? And I'm here in Milwaukee, and my family, they all live in Louisville, right? So I knew my dad was sick. I knew my dad had lung, had lung cancer. I knew that, right? At that time, the survival rate was like five years, right? So I'm here, I'm talking back and forth to my family, and uh, my dad died. He just died. Got that phone call at work. They said, Daddy, he died last night, right? Okay, so I'm younger, didn't have the kids, and and uh, I wasn't married at the time, right? And uh, maybe we were married at the time, right? But you couldn't go because you were working at the hospital or whatever, I don't know, but anyway. So I went to Louisville for the service, right, to help with the arrangements, right? And my older brothers and sisters says, Curtis, you gotta be strong. You gotta be strong. You gotta be there for mom, you got to deal for mom, right? Because my family, you know, my brother and sister, they had their own kids and they were, you know, they were small, right? So they said, they put it on me, even though I'm in the middle, right? You got to be strong, you got to be there for mom, right? So I went there and helped with the arrangements and did all that, right? So I remember sitting right there in the front row on the end with my mom, right? Like, with my arms around there and just had to suck it up, suck it up, right? So then, got through that, right? And so, Got back to Milwaukee, got back to Milwaukee. It was like, for me, it was like nothing never happened. I kept on being strong. But yet, I had these feelings about, you know, when am I going to grieve? What can I do? But they put that on me. You have to be strong. So I began to work. I kind of got back into my job, my work. And then one day, I'll never forget it. One day, I'm at work. 
And all of a sudden, it's like my mind and body just shut down. Just shut down. It's like, what's going on? So they called, you know, EMS and got to the hospital, right? So I'm sitting in the room, right? And I, I mean, it's like yesterday. I'm sitting on the edge of the bed, on the edge of the bed. And um, doctors kept asking questions. I think they called my wife. And, and so, so I, I just couldn't answer. I couldn't answer. And they said, all of a sudden, I began to cry. I cried and cried and cried like a baby. And they said that I kept saying, I never got a chance to say goodbye to dad. I never got a chance, right? And even after that, I was having some issues with depression and, and missing my father and, and all this, right? But I kept going and going and going, and I knew I needed some help. I knew I needed some help. But again, because of the whole stigma and the fear of being, of not wanting to be perceived as being weak, I chose not to seek that help. Because they put that on me 400 miles in mobile. You have to be strong. And it took me to a place, it took me to a very dark place. I had no idea that I was even going to that dark place. But it took me there until my body and my mind shut down. So again, stigma. What is it? It's a major obstacle to receiving professional help. That's what kept me from getting help, the stigma. The historical trauma, going back to what's happened in our lifetime. <coughs> the whole thing, because again, in our family, and I feel, we didn't talk about it. Don't dare mention that word. And we had aunties and uncles, and, and they would say, oh, don't worry about it. That's just the way he or she is, right? Didn't want to mention that word. And maybe some of you all are in those same situations too. So it's just not African Americans. It could be anybody. It could be anyone in our family. So again, you cannot just miss the facts that it's a historical piece. It's historical. Going back beginning with the 1700s, the whole historical trauma. <clears throat> and that's why we talk about that and look at it so we can have some understanding that when we're talking to our clients in the homes, when they've lost everything, when they're at a point that they feel like they have nothing, and then we ask them about, we just speak with someone, get some counseling or whatever, right? They say no, because our stigma is there. It's real, it's real. And it's not going anywhere until we actually address it and recognize it and talk about it. And again, we talk about the whole mental health issue, right? It's also led to other disparities in health as well. It's that the well, because the mind really does drive how we respond to healthcare. So again, it's just not siloed in mental <coughs> health. That trauma really it permeates out into how we take care and how we, you know, receive and accept healthcare as well. <coughs> so again, without giving a lot of numbers. In 2020, 52% of whites received mental health services compared to only 37% for African Americans, right? African American adults are 20% more likely to experience major depression for a number of reasons, and we'll talk about some of those later on. And look at the African American children that are aged 5 to 12, 14% are less likely than white youth of that same age to receive treatment for depression. So when you look at other numbers too, it's not on the side here, perhaps that's why we're seeing an increase of suicide among young African-American youth. Because they're not seeking treatment. They, they don't have access you know, to treatment. And because it all kind of goes back to that stigma, to that stigma. But yeah, think about it. But that doesn't mean the African Americans are not concerned about mental health. Data shows that more than 80% of African Americans are very concerned about mental health. I'm very concerned about that. So maybe like myself, maybe they realize that they need some help. They want to talk to someone, 
but it's because of the stigma. They don't want to perceive, be perceived as being weak, as being weak, particularly for African American men. So again, there's a lot of things. So on top of the, the racism, the discrimination, and just the overall awareness of mental health, it's, a, it's concerning. It's concerning. It needs to be talked about and addressed. So, what about mental health? The early narratives about mental health. The early narratives about you know the causes of mental health and illness for slaves were circulated by slave owners and white supremacists intended to justify slavery. So they had to find some reason to justify it, to justify slavery. But the most dominant ideas were the slaves were immune to mental illness due to their lack of freedom. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Oh, it's no way in the world that he can have any kind of mental illness because he's not free, because he gets everything. His food, his house, his clothes, place to live, even though it was a shack. What kind of mental illness can he have? So understanding what health means for African Americans <coughs> is understanding the history, the history of mental health, treatment for African Americans as far back as the 18th century. It's important to understand and to know that. So again, um, the most dominant idea suggested that slaves were immune to mental illness was due to their lack of freedom. Sadly, this is not unlike the present thinking today, right? Really? Think that, you know, people think like that today. Your mental health conditions was as a weakness. So this is interesting considering that weakness and fragility were incompatible with the hard labor required by the slaves. So how can you be weak on one hand, and then you're out in the fields 12 or 16 hours a day working? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So again, there were stories and there were all kinds of justifications just to, around mental health, just to justify slavery. Just to justify slavery. So again, perspectives of North American mental health. It was commonly thought the slaves were not sophisticated enough to develop depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders. Like depression, when the slaves were tired and they were weak, they felt like that, well, he's just depressed. No, he's just he's just weak. He's just he's just the way he is because of all the work. But again, understand the stigma and attitudes African Americans have of mental health should be brought and appreciated within a historic context. So again, so it's important to know the whole history behind it. Behind it. Slavery, the misconceptions, stress, and all of that. So this needs to be brought beyond just saying he needs some help or mental health. The conversation needs to be brought. Especially, like I said, for African American men. I'm part of some fatherhood groups. You know, I'm one of the founding members of the Milwaukee Father Initiative, right? And a piece of what we did was helping black men understand their trauma and their mental health, right? And it's hard, you know, it's hard. And we, we create the spaces where we make it comfortable for men to tell their stories, to kind of open up, right? And it's just, it's just, it's an experience, let me say that right, to be in a room with black men and they begin to talk about, you know, their depression, their anxiety, how they're looked at, how they feel like that they are invisible and not recognized, how they feel like they can be walking down the street and people see them as a threat and not as a father, as a man with a job, taking care of his family and doing the right thing. But it's even negative. So you can imagine how that would weigh on a black man. Because then I looked at as men of work. And I call that the whole invisibility syndrome that black men deal with every day. And it goes back. It goes back. 
it goes back, right? I can tell you another story. Like uh, several years ago, it was Sunday day, right? I was going down to Kentucky, to Louisville, right? And I was making my usual stop before I got on the freeway, which was Starbucks, Shayna, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and so I stopped and start feeling good, you know, driving by myself. <clears throat> so I'm in line at Starbucks, right? There's a door here and there's a door over here, right? So I came to the door and I'm in line. And this white gentleman was in front of me, right? So a woman came in from over here and was talking to him. Okay, fine, they're talking, right? And she placed herself between he and I. In other words, she got in front of me. So I'm. She must, have, she must have been Italian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think she's been foolish. <laughs> anyway, so I'm standing there, right? And I said, How am I going to handle this? You know, I said, Okay, now. The real code is about to come out, right? I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do it, right? So I said, ma'am, pardon me. But did you see me standing here? And then the gentleman in front of me said, oh, no. She's with me. I said, sir, how is she with you? Because you and I are in line, and she walks in talking to you and places herself between the two of us. So how is she with you? And he had the nerve to say, don't get mad. Well, you don't have to get mad at all. I wasn't mad. I was just standing up for Curtis. I was acknowledging that she was just being absolutely rude. Okay, so can you imagine how it is? I mean, I have been my front yard cutting my grass. People drove up to me and asked me, well, how much do you get cutting the yard like that? I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> I can't say the answer here. But anyway, so that's what me as a black man that I deal with, right? So that just adds, that's compounded upon the whole, all those things that I'm dealing with, you know, as far as the racism, discrimination, and all of that, and all of that. So again, so that's the added stress. That's the added stress on top of everything else that's happened in my past, going back to the 1700s, if not before. Because again, if you know anything about epigenetics, because it happened hundreds of years ago, it doesn't mean that that's not in my DNA. It doesn't affect me. It becomes generational, generational. There you go again. There we go. <laughs> so again, there's some wonderful articles out there, books that have been written. Uh, this is a book that's written by uh, a Dr. Harriet Washington, right? She was a medical anthropologist, right? And she kind of chronicles, you know, like a lot of what happened to African Americans in the way of mental health. So and there's a lot of factors that feed into that whole stigma. It's about trust. I mean, the culture. Can you relate to me? How do you relate to me and understand what I'm going through as far as my mental health? As far as my health care, how do you, as someone that doesn't look like me and talk like me, then how can you understand that? So, again, mental health, you know, for me and my community, it's, you know what? It just does not happen to us. It doesn't happen. It's not real. It's not real. And we are strong and we don't get depressed. I've had some friends of mine that when I'm feeling down and low, you know, they know me. To know, you know, what I do and who I am as a person, right? I would get down, you know, going through one of my moves, and uh, and they would say, "Well, what do you have to be depressed about? Really, <laughs> really?" And you know, and so I would say, "You know, is that a true friend? Is that a true friend?" And maybe they don't understand that. Maybe they maybe they have the like they have don't have the knowledge that I'm going to have about the stigma, or maybe they do. And just don't want to talk about it. Maybe they do and just don't know how to talk about it, right? And, you know, uh, so again, so as a public health professional for 31 years, the consumer mental health services, it's critical to explore the impact of racism as a public health hazard, as a public health hazard in the mental health arena. So again, you know, 
people talking about racism now, it's after like spilled milk. COVID, you know, I'm pulling the blankets back on so much, on so much, right? COVID did, right? Racism, you hear a lot about, you know, health equity <coughs> and the social determinants of health now. But again, so that tells me we all were affected by COVID. We all are affected or impacted in one way or another by racism. We all are impacted or affected by mental health. So we all need to broaden and have those conversations because it's everyone's responsibility. Anyone in here seen 12 Years a Slave? You might see that movie. Okay, you want to tell us what the movie was about? And what you remember about the movie? It was amazing and incredibly sad. In what way was it sad? That another human being had to exist in, in that environment and figure out what to do to, to cope with it. Um, and that other people could look on and be ignorant about what this person's experience mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. like. Anybody else? I saw two hands go up. Anybody else? Yes, go. I watched the first 20 minutes and couldn't finish. Mm -hmm. Right. It was, too, it was too upsetting. Okay. Well, the movie actually is a true story, actually. Okay, in 1853, a young man, Solomon Northrop, was tricked. He was drugged and tricked and sold into slavery for 12 years. He was born free in Washington, D.C. But he was tricked, he was drugged, he was sold into slavery for 12 years. And he tried to escape to freedom for 12 years. And because he was trying to escape, then he was pegged as having mental health issues just because he wanted to be free. He's crazy, he's depressed, he's insane. For 12 years, and fortunately, he found freedom. He befriended he some individuals in Canada who knew his parents are uh, uh, in DC, and he was free, he found it. They, they got him out, right? But then at the end of the movie, it says that he just fell off the face of the earth. He disappeared. He was seen. He wrote the book. He was well known. He would give lectures on his experience. And all of a sudden, he just disappeared. And there's several, several theories about what happened to him. And one theory is that he never got past the 12 years of being enslaved. He became, you know, loose and drinking, and he just lost and just disappeared. 12 years, 12 years. And he was sold to slavery in Louisiana. So he was born free in D.C. and became a slave in Louisiana and just disappeared. And then, you know, if you research him, that's one of the biggest mysteries about no one knows. And that's one of the things, that's something that they are still trying to figure out. What happened to, to Solomon, but no one knows. But again, you know, so if you look at some of the historical, you know, key influencers around mental health, you know, it's an interesting, interesting characters out there, right? But before 1700, little or no references are available regarding mental health for people of African descent whatsoever. It's just not there. It wasn't important. But in 1848, Dr. John Gall offered that blacks are immune to mental illness. They can't possibly have mental illness. Impossible. Why? How? 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 In 1851, Dr. Samuel Cartwright, a report on the diseases of physical, you know, peculiarities of the Negro race. What's going on with the Negroes? You know, what's going on with them? They're acting this way, that way. What's going on? Post-Civil War, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who is the father, who was named as the father of American psychiatry, 
it's a rational desire for blacks to become white. Really? <laughs> it's an irrational desire for blacks to become white. Maybe that's because they wanted their freedom. They would be free. Maybe that's why. 1895, Dr. T.O. Powell, freedom generated a rise in insanity. Now look what we've done. <laughs> now look what's happening now. The Negroes are acting up. They're free and they're just gone crazy. Really? <coughs> I'll probably be one of them too. <laughs> <clears throat> so again, a slave named Kate. This is the earliest you will find any information about a slave. So the early stone mention of the slave mental health case was in 1745. Kate was a slave that was accused of mur murdering a child. At the time in jail, she was determined to be out of the census, insane. Her owner was too poor to pay for health care, right, for treatment in a mental institution, right? So the Carolina State Assembly, they passed a provision that required each parish that has slaves to pay for public maintenance. Not treatment, mind you, but public maintenance of slaves for mental health care. So there's no records what happened to Kate. There's no records whatsoever. But again, this was the earliest mention of mental health as, as it pertains to a slave. Dr. John Gall, okay, these guys were really interesting, right? A physician and medical director of the Eastern Lunatic Asylum in Williamsburg, Virginia. He said, hey, it's impossible, <coughs> impossible for slaves or blacks to have mental health care. His hypothesis, slaves could not develop mental health care because as a slave people, they didn't own property, engage in commerce, or participate in civic affairs such as voting or holding offices. So what do they have to be worried about? What do they have to be depressed about, right? Really? Because they weren't engaged in society, they had no worries because everything was taken care of for them. How could they get depressed? How could they be throwing down? They have no worries, but give them everything they want. Anyway, Sammy Cartwright, best known as the inventor of the mental illness, great mania, right? The desire of a slave to be free. Really? Oh, he wants to be free, so he's ill, right? So he wrote a report to justify in his defense slavery as a natural benefit to both the slaves and the slave owners. He said the slaves should be kept in a submissive state and treated like children with care, kindness, and humanity to prevent and cure them from running away. So again, so the symptoms of this great to mania, right? It was like the urge to flee, to, to flee and be free. And then, you know, from the beatings, they were saying the symptoms also included lesions and sores. The lesions and sores were from punishment from trying to run away. And then they would even amputate the toes. Can you imagine that? T.O. Powell in 1895, right? The superintendent of the Georgia Lunatic you know, Asylum, right? So in 1895, he saw the alarming increase in the sanity and tuberculosis in blacks. He argued that when former slaves got the freedom, it caused them to have little or no control over their appetites and passions, you know, uh, it's bad to have too much fun, hanging out, seeking their family. Oh, they're, they're crazy, they're going wild, right? Really? 
So you are slaves, right? I'm thinking how I would react to this, right? I would say, you know, I'm out of here. The chances of not knowing me, I'd probably go, but wow, I'm free. I want to eat food. I want to eat decent food. I want to have fun. I want to seek my family out and find my wife and kids that were sold off to other plantations. I want to be together. I want to party. Isn't that natural? Isn't that natural? I can really relate to that. I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> my wife probably don't want to hear this, right? Yeah, I'll tell you the way, right? <laughs> I broke my right ankle about, what, two years ago? It's going on a year and a half. Okay, about a year and a half, right? I couldn't drive. I mean, I'm out doing stuff in the yard and the house. I, you know, I'm, I'm doing this. So, as she says, which I didn't, right? She said, I fell for what? Which I did. Yes, you did. We won't debate that now. Right? <laughs> but anyway, so, as she says, I'm always on the go. I'm always doing things, right? Okay. And so, when I broke my ankle, it, it came to a complete stop. You know, I was in this chair in the uh, sun room, right? I would look outside, summertime, the trees, like where I love being outdoors. I, I love the garden, cut my grass. I'm sitting there, right? I'm looking, right? And I'm saying, oh my God, this is hard, right? And I would have crying spell. I would literally have crying spell. Jane, I can't do this anymore. I can't, and she would say, do you need some help? Do you want me to take you somewhere? And so, and she did, you know, then, I call my friends up, you know, and they would come and take me places sometimes. And I even had the baristas from Starbucks bringing me coffee to the house. <laughs> they sit in the house and talk and laugh and have a good time, right? <clears throat> so I had all the support in the world, right? But then I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't go anywhere, right? And so as I progress, you know, in my treatment, right? You know, I got, you know, the cask off, you know, and and then uh, I got the boot, you know, Dr. Donna, still can't drive, still can't drive, right? But then, when that boot came off, it was on then. <laughs> I said, I'm out of here, right? And my wife says, and she hasn't really seen me since, right? But again, <laughs> but it, that was just my experience right there. That was situational depression. And she asked me, she said, do you need some help? You need me to take you somewhere? But in all seriousness, I was in a very, very dark place. A dark place, right? And then, but then, even though I know about the health stigma, I should ask me, you okay? What would I say? Then, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm good. Mm -hmm. I'm real good. Now, I knew I wasn't good. And I knew too. <laughs> she said that's really one of the, one of the, it's a very bad time for the family. Yes, it was. <laughs> We were all miserable. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I can understand the space. Can you imagine being locked up, being a slave? Then once you're free, you want to get out. You want to have fun. You do the things. Cause I, when that cast came off, I asked the doctor every day, when can I drive? When can I? And then when he said, you drive, boom, I took off. <laughs> so so again, vision and rush. Rush. Recognized as a father of family psychiatry, right? But he was conflicted in so many ways, right? He was first to believe that mental illness is a disease of the mind and not a possession of demons. He said that Negro suffered from leprosy, and the only way that would be cured was, would be by becoming white. <laughs> he believed that black skin was a black leprosy and endured surgical operations and pain. Mm. But he was conflicted in so many ways. So many ways, right? Because he was an avid, you know, abolitionist, right? He had, you know, found the first black church in Philadelphia, but yet, but yet, he bought a child slave. He bought a child slave by the name of William Gruber. So he kept William for 20 years, even though, even though he fought against slavery. He was an abolitionist. He had his own little dark secret. He was conflicted. So he had a different belief 
but yet his actions were con were, uh, con uh, contradicted that, right? Cognitive distance, right? A belief and action are totally conflicting, right? But again, but he had a heart. So in 1794, he finally re released William. He finally released him after, only after he got his money's worth <coughs> out of him. Mm -hmm. But yet, <coughs> Dr. Rush is termed as a father of psychiatry. Men have facilities during the pre-Civil War, right? Slaves could not have access to the asylums, not at all, right? They were housed outdoors. You see pictures of these asylums back in the, those days. They had large courtyards. And the slaves weren't admitted to the asylums. They were kept outside. They couldn't mix with the white patients indoors. And child slaves were often misused and misdiagnosed just to perform the labor, the task, in the asylums to take care of the patients. Sometimes, you know, the, the kids, I mean, children were accused of crimes and things, just <laughs> they could used as attendants and servants you know, in the asylums where they could not have access to. So again, so these asylums where they were, they had nearby labor farm, farms. So these asylums were actually loan out the slaves that were there supposedly for treatment to the labor farms for, for free labor. But yet, but yet, the children, you know, in these places, right, they were praised. They were praised for being intelligent, for doing the work, doing a great job in whatever they were assigned to do. So again, so by the fact that these were places where slaves and African Americans could go to, right? But yet once inside, then it was a total different arrangement, right? So perhaps, perhaps this in itself is the beginning of the distrust that African Americans have in the mental health and healthcare field. The mistrust. We don't know what we're getting to. You're saying one thing, but yet could be something totally different. But yet, you have to wonder, so if these slaves were turned to be out of their senses, right, why were they able to do the phenomenal work inside, the, you know, these facilities for treatment, if they were insane? So they were deemed to be insane to get in, but once they were inside <laughs> there for treatment, then they were given these tasks to do. They're very intelligent, hard workers, smart, and they things sometimes, sometimes they actually help in the treatment of those that were housed there as well. So again, the pre-Civil War mental health facilities between 1840 and 1847, right? The largest one at the time was the Georgia Lunatic Asylum, right? It was built by slaves, slave labor, but yet it was operated exclusively by the slaves themselves. So they built it, and outside of any type of clinical care, whatever that was, they ran it as well. They ran it as well, right? And they didn't have a choice. They weren't paid, they were ordered to do it. If they didn't do it, then they suffered consequences behind that. Post-Civil War facilities, right? Central state. It seems like we do the research right. Every state in this country either had or held a central state hospital for mental illness, right? So again, the central state, you know, it was for colored people only, right? It opened in 1879 and it housed like a warehouse for free slaves. <laughs> there weren't any intentions to give any type of treatment there. It was like a warehouse, just to get them off the street, just give them some place to stay, just so they would just disappear, right? And again, it was by physicians, some of which I talked about in previous slides, right? 
who created these mental health false narratives about the condition, why they were there, why did they need to stay there. So again, all the staff was black, whereas all the all the providers were white. So it was like a slave colony. So it was like a big disparity, a big disparity, right? It was underfunded. And basically, like I say, it was really just built to punish the people, the free slaves, to punish. There wasn't any treatment there. So again, um, so you even got, you know, there were reports that the Central State Hospital, you know, they were saying, they were saying their worst patients just off. Just sit in the hall to nowhere. But yet you had the Eastern State Hospital, which was the highest performing mental health hospital. What they would do, they were saying they're high performing, and I don't know if they would mean what they meant by that. They were saying they're high performing patients to Central State. I mean, they were saying they're lowest performing patients to, to Central State. So if you were at you know the white facility, you weren't responding to treatment. You know, they were seeing you in the central state, but there's nothing more we can do for you. Just send them to the black hospital because, again, there's nothing more. So, really, the central state hospital was like a place for the throwaway patients from the eastern state hospital. So, the start of the 20th century, right? We had the eugenics movement, it began in Great Britain. In about the 1920s, it was here in this country, right? But it quickly focused on African Americans, based, based on two principles. Good genetic stock, and mental illness, poor, being unfit for kids that can reproduce and have babies, and those accused of sexual crimes. <laughs> so again, so in the 20th century, after Americans you know we face even more, more problems and more issues and more deficiencies as far as mental health. Sterilization in this country, it quickly focused on African Americans. In California, even though African Americans comprise of 1% of the population, the 4% of those that were sterilized were African Americans. So again, so again, um, it hasn't been a good experience in many areas of mental health by African Americans. Eventually, 18 states passed laws allowing for the widespread sterilization of individuals that were in, that were institutionalized, including many who were black, those who were misdiagnosed and those were that were falsely accused of crimes. But then, this thing, not too long ago, in the 1970s, forced sterilization was so common in the South, it was sometimes referred to as a Mississippi epidemic. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? The bodies, psychosurgery, 1930s to 1960s, right? During the social unrest, civil rights, you know, marches and all that, back in the 1960s, there were a lot of urban uprisings, right? Resistance, you know, and reactions to people just got tired of the systemic oppression, the poverty, and systemic racism, which was a result, which resulted in. Um, in uh, the violence, right? Well, they think the one way we can get rid of all this unrest is to do the violence, the violence, which is part a process, a part of removing part of the brain, promoted as a surgical treatment for brain disorder, promoted as a treatment for brain dysfunction, resulting in widespread urban violence 
an inner city of Rosses. So again, so the figure, you know, during the civil rights movement in the 60s, that's what's going on. There's a brain disorder. Let's remove part of the brain to really to squash the civil unrest. But again, it wasn't widely accepted, and there was a lot of pushback because at, at times they were forming the bodies on children as far as far as young as five years old who exhibited aggressive or hyperactive behaviors. So outside of mistreating, you know, the civil unrest, you know, with the lobotomies, psychosurgery, whatever you call it, it may be good for treating, you know, black children that are aggressive. And I wouldn't even say they were aggressive. I was just say they were just being kids. Being assertive. Sometimes people see that assertion as being aggressive. <coughs> for a five-year-old, for a five-year-old, is it aggression? Or is it just being a five-year-old kid and just being assertive? Schizophrenic diagnosis. In the 30s and 40s, it was mainly used you know, for white middle-class women. But again, in the 60s, okay, with the uprisings, particularly the Black Power Movement, then it was linked to being violent. Oh, you sit so, because you're violent, because you're fighting for your rights, you're fighting for your freedom, you're fighting to be recognized, you gotta be schizo. Black men who are leaders in that movement, they were more than likely to be Probably diagnosed as being schizo. And as a result, then black men were overly diagnosed as being schizophrenic, while underdiagnosed with post traumatic stress disorder and mood disorders, right? Maybe I'm this way because of my past, of my background. Maybe I'm this way of what happened in my life in the past. But that was never considered. It was just considered that they were violent, and okay, fine. So let's throw this label on them as the schizo, which followed them until they were in the grave. Self care. Here's a radical history, right? You know, I'm going to tell you, uh, a COVID, right? <laughs> I worked in public health for over 31 years, right? We would have these long meetings, right? We'd be in these conference rooms, you know, for four or five, six hours of time, right? And for COVID, you never heard the word about self-care, right? It's kind of funny. When they would take a break, they would say, oh, we need a, a bio break. And I first heard that term and said, so what's a bio break? What is that about, right? It's a bathroom break, right? And then during COVID, I was still assigned to the state COVID response team, right? We'd be on the Zoom meetings all day long, from early morning until in evening, right? And then it was only during COVID that we even began to use the term self-care. Oh, that's important. You're on this cause, you're homework, you're isolated. Let's take, you know, let's turn our cameras off and turn the lights off and sit back in the chair. Y'all know how to continue, right? Put your feet on the floor, take deep breaths, right? And, oh yeah, here we go again, like, right? you know, I would. But anyway, but again, but self care actually began as part of the Black Panther Party movement. <clears throat> They're the ones that made it popular, right? Because Angela Davis and others in the Black Power movement, they felt like we need to take care of ourselves. Let's do the whole yoga thing, let's relax, let's take deep breaths. They're the ones that really popularized self care back in the 60s because they didn't want to burn themselves out. So Angie Davis said, we got work to do. We got to get out here in March and do this and do that. So let's take care of ourselves first. So self-care, it was nothing new. It had been around since the 40s, but it was really popularized by the Black Panther movement. Even Rosa Parks is known to do, have done self-care, yoga. I mean, I've known Rosa Parks, you know, I've known about her. We all know about Rosa Parks, right? But I've never read anything. I've known her to do the whole yoga thing. The research does say in this hair is being 
a very avid, you know, advocate, a good advocate for self-care and yoga because that's what she did. That's what she did. But again, telling the African American modern day story of mental health. But let's talk about that in the way of the social determinants of health. So again, it cannot be talked about if we don't talk about the social determinants of health and how that impacts African Americans and other minority populations. Think about it. Extreme, extreme, you know, poverty, uh, the lack of education, uh, the systemic racism, oppression, all of that, all of that, the social economic status, that does impact mental health. I know even during COVID, right, they talk about how individuals have a challenge in, in you know, with, with COVID, the different populations, right? And my colleagues would always say, you know what, we're all in this together, we're all in the same boat. I Meaning we all are in the boat of COVID, right? We're all in the same boat. I said, but some of us are in boats without a paddle. Some of us are in boats with holes in them. So we all are in, you know, this together, but we're in different places, different places. Why were some populations more impacted by COVID than others, particularly in the beginning? In the beginning. So again, so there's so much <coughs> in the story of mental health, not only for African Americans, but for other populations as well. Oh, this is something here. I don't know if y'all heard that, but I thought it would come through on the screen there. But I'm just going to read uh, the story of African American mental health cannot be told without recognizing the history of oppression, terrorism, and racism that continues to this very day. Continues to this very day, right? In 1965, during the Civil Rights era, President Johnson acknowledged opening doors to equal opportunities. So, in 1965, during the Civil Rights era, President Johnson acknowledged opening doors to equal opportunities and resources, such as fair housing, <coughs> jobs, education, health, and mental health treatment, that it wasn't enough. That the history had to be acknowledged, respected, and valued in order to address stigma, address barriers in order to embed equity in mental health care, for all. So again, equity in mental health care for all, right? So it's not equity, it's not giving everyone the same thing, it's giving populations what they need, what they need. Case in point, if there's a fire, let's say in River Hills, at a million dollar home, right? Chances are they have all this and all that, right? If there's a fire in the inner city, right, that we normally respond to, right? Would you want to, would you, do you think that the person that's living in a million dollar house in River Hills 
has the same needs and wants as someone that we normally see on 24th and Center Street? Absolutely not. So equity is giving individuals what they need. It's what they need, right? So again, so that's what President Johnson was referring to. It's like, let's embed equity in mental health. In mental health. So again, the crucial conversations that need to be had to move to action, right? There needs to be conversations among all Americans. I say all Americans because we all at some point deal with mental health. We have that need. So it's something that we all need to be involved in in these conversations, you know, to eliminate the stigma, you know, and the silence so that we can have good outcomes. Help individuals to get on the path toward healing and toward recovery. And we have to engage. We cannot ignore, we cannot ignore the accurate historical and current narratives to get on the proper path to heal it ourselves, our children, and to sustain our future. So again, uh, and conversations are critical. Telling our stories is critical. Like I tell my story. I'm very comfortable in telling my story. Because I'm going to tell you, when you tell your story, tell your story, you open a person's mind. And sometimes I'm telling my story, I'm prompted to tell another story. Because I call that, there's always a story within the story. I've been down, I've been outreach, you know, to homeless individuals under the bridge who have some very, very obvious mental health issues, right? And, and I don't ask them, I say, I don't ask them, what's wrong with you? I want to know what happened to you. And then they tell the story, you know, the story that they think that I want to hear. But then I've learned with myself to ask questions about, to bring out that other story. I call that the danger of the single story. Because chances are, this person wants me to see him for what he is. And then I've learned to ask <coughs> questions about families, about people that are important to them. And you'll be amazed, amazed at how they might up, they talk, because everyone has some good in the story. So we talk to individuals, you know, as part of a disaster, whether it's at their home, whether it's at a shelter. How do we relate to those individuals? How do we help them to tell their story? And sometimes that may be sharing our story or the story of someone else, as comfortable as you may be. And you never know the impact that story may have. If you tell them that's your story, it may help them to open up and tell their story. It may open a doorway to help them to seek help and to be healed uh, from from their uh, their the world to recover. So again, telling stories it helps us to eliminate the stereotypes, how we see people, how we may misunderstand people. You know, and then again, like myself, right? How the person, you know, in Starbucks perceived me as being mad. He saw me as a mad black man. How many times have you heard that in the media, in print, television? He's a mad black man. And I refuse to give him that power over me. I refuse to let him put that name on me as being a mad black man. Even though inside it took its toll on me, I was about ready to go up in there, right? But again, but again, I refuse to let him do that. So again, again, we have to talk about the mistrust that we have, African Americans have, in both the medical and the uh, in the mental health uh, field. Tell the story. Tell the stories, right? You don't have to tell the whole story, but we all have stories we can tell and tell those as comfortable as you feel like and sharing as much as you, you know, feel comfortable in sharing. Um, increase diversity in mental health providers, right? 
it takes a long, took me a long time to find, to find someone that looks like me, talks like me, to understand my culture and the history. Because again, it's not for being African Americans that are in the mental health field. And pay for it. How do you pay for it? It's not, it's not cheap. There needs to be an increase in excess in payment. Alice Walker, right? She's the author of The Color Purple. There's a movie, they did the movie just uh, not long ago, right? She said, we need to collect all of the threads of our past when we sit down to create a quilt that represents the lives of African American people. So using pieces of string and torn clothing, quilting was a way the slaves kept the visual culture and traditions of their native Africa alive and to weave the culture and tradition to the fabric of their daily lives. This passage from Alice's poem, Dedication, captures the need for all of us to do that, for all of us to do that, to listen, to value the history and stories, to continue moving forward in the struggle to heal those of us who identify as African American, when they help consumers, as myself, survivors, and those struggling in the space of darkness. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> so, do we have time for any questions or discussion? Anybody want to? Ask a question. <laughs> or rocks. I'm good. I'm not <laughs> taking. Yeah, so people online should put your questions, discussion um, in the chat. Questions in the room. Comments. Yes. <clears throat> hey, I, I, am, I understand the statistics might be a bit hard to, to be drawn, but do you know if mental health diseases are in percentage higher in white people, Caucasian, than in, uh, than in African American? You know what, see, when you look at the, at the data, right, the numbers, right, it's not that much of a difference. It's not that much of a difference. But where the gap and where the disparity is, is that there's a higher number of Caucasian individuals that have access to many health services than African Americans. That's where the disparity is, right? So it's like the last time I looked, it was like it was almost even, and I can't recall the exact numbers. No. So the disparity is the fact that you know Caucasians and other populations are more likely to to have access to mental health services than minorities. A lot of that could be you know due to you know resources to pay for, it. resources to pay for it because it's not cheap. What type of insurance do you have? How comfortable do you feel like? And talked about it. How much effort do you put into finding, you know, public resources, you know, that can really address, you know, mental health, you know, and provide that care, right? And I'm saying, you know what? I recall, I never forget it, right? When I, uh, when I first started in public health, right, uh, eons and eons and eons ago, right, I was, I was told to go to all the, the bureau chiefs in Madison, right, in the Department of Health Services, right, and just meet with the bureau chiefs, right, and just kind of Find out what they do and how public health did this and did that, right? So I went to one bureau chief, right? And and in her department, it's, it's like there was a, a slither of a program to kind of address mental health you know, at the state level, right? And so I asked her, I said, so I said, so why isn't there a much broader uh, scope of work in DHS around mental health? You know what you told me? You know what you told me? I was shocked. She said, well, my only answer is that mental health is not like an illness where you can't provide a regimen of medication and it's gone overnight. I never forget that, right? And she said, that's why we don't put a lot of resources into it, right? But then think about that, right? Resources, like for me, my resource, when I was going through, you know, my, my, my thing, was my wife, my friend, my son, you know, all, I had all these resources around me, right? 
So I think, how can we just kind of get away from thinking that mental health can be always be treated with a pill? And that's African Americans. African Americans have always relied, you know, on family, on family. The church in particular, right? The church has been very instrumental in supporting black families. But there comes a time where you need that clinical care, that clinical connection, right? So again, so even though you know you may not have, you may not have uh, the resources, you know, to, to pay or the insurance or whatever to pay for professional. <laughs> Healthcare, right? There's a lot of programs you know, in Milwaukee. I'm on the Milwaukee County Task Force for Mental Health. So I'm aware there's a lot of resources out there that individuals can be connected with that are free. That are free. So in the absence of having money, there are other resources out there that we can connect individuals to that can help narrow that disparity, you know, as far as treatment. Um. So is there any data looking at the providers? Because I imagine that, you know, different communities when when people do seek out mental health services, they're perhaps maybe looking for people who understand their unique histories. And so do people in the African American community have a difficult more difficult time finding, you know, mental health professionals who those who are also African-American or people of color? Yeah, I know it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough, right? Because again, uh, now everything is online. A lot of agencies like, like SDC and the advocates, you know, they don't print that anymore, right? You go around there, right? You know, it's all around, it's all around. Like, a lot of people, you know, don't have access to the internet. They don't use computers. They don't have smartphones and all of that. So again, the data is out there. There's no fact that there aren't very many African American, you know, mental health providers. And that's why some of the initiatives I'm involved in, I'm on the, uh, I was involved with the uh, WISE, the Wisconsin Initiative to Stigma Elimination, right? Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of work, you know, on the ground to really increase the awareness of the need for more African American mental health providers. But a lot of that, you know, it's out there now, but you have to know where to go look for it. You have to have the tools to do that. How many people now that don't have computers and smartphones that go to a library? Not very many at all. At all. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you so much. My name is uh, Denise, and I'm a graduate student uh, at the UWM, Southern Criminal Justice and Criminology. So um, uh, the discussion has uh, really thrown a lot of uh, light into some of the courses I've been offering. And uh, um, I really uh, appreciate you working through this historical perspective. But uh, one thing that I uh, really see that is silent about the uh, presentation is about the role of the religion in this uh, uh, discussion, because uh, particularly we are talking about Africa, uh, American. So, and uh, you, as an African, you cannot divulge the, the role of the religion from this uh, uh, discussion. So, it's so important. So, I would have expected that you uh, shed more light on the role of religion in this uh, historical perspective that we are sharing. So, yeah, this really plays a significant role in the life of uh, uh, Black Africans. And that's why, at the point, they are mentioning that uh, uh, Africans are not only really affected by mental health. Because the, the religion really play a critical role in suppressing some of these mental issues in Africa. So, thank you. Now I need your phone number, man. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate that. Is my question over here? Yes, I, I do have a couple comments. The, the first thing that really impressed me was the, the, the philosophy of the of Ubuntu, mm -hmm. which I've never heard of, standing on the on the shoulders of those who've gone before me. To, or before that, uh, that sheds a lot of light on uh, things. But one question I do have: when you were saying you were in a that response that African American just um, barely got by with um, having his two young children gone, and he needed mental health, what can we say to like maybe change their mind, or, or to, to take away the stigma? What can we do as that people who have just a couple minutes really 
You know what I've done? I'm telling you, you know what I've done, and actually I did this with uh, the young man that lost his uh, nine-year-old daughter in a fire. Not too long ago, right? I just got his phone number, gave him a call. Gave him a call, right? Because at that time, right, with everything going on, I'm thinking, you know, can you really comprehend it? You know what we're asking? Because again, I mean, he's traumatized. He's traumatized, right? So for me personally, that's what I've done. The young man that lost his daughter, you know, in the fire, right? Talking to him several times, connecting him to some father programs. Because these are men that support, these are pure support groups, right? And he appreciated that. And he did attend several of the fatherhood groups. And they wrapped their arms around him and just let, it, let him get it out. Is that the norm? Absolutely not. But again, uh, this young man obviously was on the edge. He got his phone number, called him, checked in with him. I'm not a social worker. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm just a concerned individual, right? So again, so for me personally, I've just taken a Red Cross hell, a Red Cross vest, even wrong. Hey, I'm here as a, as a husband, as a father, and I feel your pain. And sometimes, you know, that's all you have to say. Now, will they react to that all the time? Probably not. Because again, when you respond to, when I respond to a fight, they've lost everything. They're probably more concerned about housing, food, clothing, things like that, right? So just saying that this is something that we offer, is it enough for them to think about, well, maybe I do need to do that. And how can we circle back? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we have case workers that follow up, right? Mm -hmm. They do follow up, and they offer that. But again, I think sometimes it's just for me, it's taking that personal step forward. I mean, making that extra effort. I just want to make sure that you're okay. You know, I understand you just lost your daughter, you just lost your, your kids. He said that, said, all we have now are the socks that they have on their feet and diapers. That's all we have. So I'm not going to say, well, you know, we offered this and that, but he didn't want it. That thing's kind of unrealistic for us to expect them to react and to accept that at that moment. <clears throat> You are raising uh, a delicate point here, uh, because what I, my conclusion would be, mm, this, this person doesn't want any help, but she or he will need help. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to tick the box of mental health, and somebody's going to call him anyway. By the way, we should never use mental health, uh, because this is, something, <laughs> yeah, I understand. this is something that I've heard people using. Mental, mental health should be totally avoided, <coughs> number one. So, in, uh, because I have been in situations where I, I saw the person was uh, distressed, but when we offer the service of a counselor, they began to withdraw. They say, <coughs> oh, well, no, it's okay. So, I don't know now if by listening to you the next time I'm in that situation, I'm going to say, okay, but then I check the box anyway. So somebody's going to call him or her because, or not. Or I'm going to say, okay, like you said, we didn't want any help, no help. Uh, yeah, I say it's, it's a bit too, I, I'm not capable. I'm not capable of, uh, I don't have the, the, the preparation, the, the, the language skills. Sometimes I don't even understand what they say, the African American. So imagine if I'm able to speak with a person who has mental problems. You know, or is in distress in that time. So I cannot do this. I have to delegate that to somebody else. So that, that I would also uh, I'd like to hear Sheena on that. Mm -hmm. Because this is a, no, it, it's a matter of uh, approach. Yeah. In, and you know, in, uh, in the training, I think you cannot force that. You no, no, we're not supposed to. Well, we're not supposed uh, uh, check a box if, if someone doesn't want it to be checked. But I think that there is something to 
what Curtis was saying is that there are a lot of situations where clients, they're overwhelmed and then we're giving them a lot of information. You know, you need to do this, you need to do that. We're having the recovery conversation. Oh, do you need health services? Oh, do you, you know, and we're going through all that and it is overwhelming. It, it, you know, there were clients last night, right, when we called them. I don't know who it was that called one of the clients last night. What did they say? We're overwhelmed. Can you call us in the morning? I think sometimes a lot of what we're doing, we are also, we get in a rush, right? We have to check ourselves. We're that responders. Oh, I'm up in the middle of the night. I need to do this. We're in a rush. I want to go back to sleep. We're rushing through it. We're not taking our time. If we slow down, we go through what we need to go through with the client. I don't think there is any harm. If we look at, you know, we really take this seriously. What can we do to try and offer better support? Is it just that quick call in the morning if you have time? You know, is it that outreach to casework to say, hey, casework, this client was really struggling. Is there any way that a follow-up call could be placed sooner? How can we look at uh, working with our disaster mental health team, which I think we've got one in the room here, um, to get services to people a little bit, you know, quicker if they do select that help. Having more of those conversations with um, our disaster mental health team, I think after this, about how we can offer that support. Because I've certainly responded to uh, uh, fires. Been the first one where it's another black family sitting in front of me who's lost everything, who's has family members in the hospital who are on the verge. And if I even get to, I don't even say mental health, but if I even before I fully get out, I'm, I'm good. But if I have called them, which I've done that a couple of times, the next day after they've settled a little bit and just said, how are you doing? <clears throat> what can we do to help? Those two questions can go a long way. It doesn't always work, right? It doesn't always get to um, <coughs> them saying yes right away. But just starting by how are you doing? What can I do to help? And asking open-ended questions and allowing people to open up a little bit and having a conversation. I think some of that is missing. And yes, that's beyond the initial debt response, right? So I think as an organization, that's some pieces that we have to figure out. Uh, and I think more conversation that we need to have. But there are many, but where we can start, right, is when we have a lot of face time in our shelters. We have a lot of face time with clients. That's why I'm always advocating, we need mental health here. <laughs> and they need to be here for seven to seven or whatever the hours are because there are times when people just need to sit and process and think and talk and they need to get it out and it's not always going to happen right away, right? It's not going to always happen in that 9 to 11 when it's convenient for us. It's what is in the best interest of the clients and that's what we have to have a collective conversation here in this room with our mental health team as an organization about how do we better support people who are dealing with day-to-day -day trauma right? A lot of the families that we end up assisting, they're already on the brink. And then they have a disaster and that just sends them over a lot of times. And what are we doing to better assist those individuals? What are we doing to better help and offer support? I think those are conversations that we have to have. But one initial step that I think we could all take is if there is that client and a lot of you have good intuition where it's like they were really not okay. Can you reach out to casework and make a connection sooner? We have mental health leads, we have health services leads. Can we reach out and see is that, you know, if, if they didn't select it, can we have a conversation of maybe what can we do, right? We don't want to override anyone's uh, uh, wishes if they said no, but what could we do? What can we offer? I think those are some initial things we can do. Um, we can do to start. Yes. You can address a lot of mental health needs if you don't label it as addressing mental health needs. Mm -hmm. Why won't you label aside? Yes. And, and go. 
tell us, tell the group who you are, because I don't think most people know, just so uh, they are aware. I'm a retired psychiatrist. I was just uh, trained in the medical college uh, up until about a year and a half ago. I am a newbie in disaster mental health. I'm still a trainee. Actually, I'm, I haven't mastered our seat yet. Yeah. Um, but I am a newbie in this field. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a psychiatrist in Milwaukee for about 35 years. But yeah, elaborate on the hotel. Also, um, I don't remember when. It was long, long, long ago. The Red Cross actually sponsored a homeless mental health clinic at the guest house. And I was the only doctor there for 10 years, night and month. Eventually, the Red Cross decided it wasn't quite their mission, and it went over to the ad for something else. Um, and there were some nurses, and it was a good from home group. But uh, the hardest thing was to get people in the door. Right. Yeah, I'm not, sorry, I, I don't want to take any time. But when you write this on the case trauma, you know, at the end, you go in the box, mm -hmm. and you write, you could write there, the client refused to receive uh, mental health support. But my feeling is that he or she very stressed. Who's reading that? And when? Who's reading the case and comments? The case comments. Yeah, when yeah. it is read. There is somebody who every hour no. No, it's not happening every hour, no. No. Yeah. Once the um, case worker, that's what you're talking about yeah. after it's, that. It's really yes, that's happening. So that's what I'm saying. If you feel that there's an urgent situation or need for help, um, and that client declined mental health is an outreach to uh, Deb, or I'm sorry, I can't say uh, your name. But, uh, oh, Dave. Dave, yes, Dave. An outreach to Dave to our mental health team to say, hey, you know, this occurred on a DAT call. Can we talk through this? What maybe services can we offer? They declined mental health services. That's what we <coughs> do with that responders to kind of take that next step. To offer support, but yes, it, it's not happening right away. Yeah, Paul. So one thing, you know, kind of follow up on what Dave said. One thing I know is sort of works when you see somebody that's stressed is because as soon as you say we offer mental health services, they shut down. Anybody like that seems to shut down. So I usually just do that just to pay my lip service to it. And, and then when I'm getting to the end, when I ask them, oh, is there anything else we can do? Even if they say no at that time, and I sense it, then usually that's when I'll say something like, you know, this is a really tough time to go through. I can't even imagine what you're going through right now. Um, and now I'll try to, either I'll make, make believe a story, or I'll use a real one if I have one, but, you know, I'll say, I have a lot of going through this, lost audio. Um, a, a similar situation where, you know, it's, it's okay to reach out, and, and you don't have to do it now, but you can reach out later, there's a caseworker calling you, to try to break that, that, conversation down so that they feel comfortable that it's okay to ask for help. Mm -hmm. Sometimes at that point, believe it or not, I've been surprised, I've had a lot more people ask at that point, well, yeah, you could mark that down for me, than when I would ask them up front. Mm -hmm. So if you make it part of a conversation and a story about how tough it is right now, and that it's okay to, to feel, feel this, but it's, it's probably not okay to do it by yourself. So whether it's family, friends, or our services, um, and, and make it more just a conversation. Uh, like, I, like I said, I've found at least on three or four occasions where people turn around again and say, well, you know what, maybe you can mark that for me now. Um, and then also, if, it, if it's really like the one that Curtis pointed out, um, we do have ICC fees that go out, so that's a little bit different. But I would always call if I really felt it was serious. Yeah. I would call whatever mental health services contact that I know. And if I didn't know one, then I would call Shana or Bill and say, you know, I've got a case here that they really need to be, somebody needs to reach out to them other than me. Yeah. So, you know, the real key is to try to stress it with them in a conversation. I, I think that's the real key. The second part is if you really feel that seriously, don't write it in a note, call somebody. Call yeah. somebody and say, hey, somebody might want to follow up with them. Yeah. I don't know whether they ever really do, but. My feeling is most of the time people seem to reach out after that and do it. So. Um, I know we've got, uh, I think Lori and Elise, maybe you had your hand raised. 
I do. Actually, I have the same thing as Fred Rico. Okay. About uh, I know we have some questions in the chat, so just give me a second. Um, Curtis, a question. Do you happen to know what percentage of suicide in black military versus white? Don't have a clue. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Terry. <laughs> Terry Curtis, we'll get back to you. Um, a question, another question. How, how will I, a white person, be perceived by a black or brown person as I reach out to support them in a crisis situation? I'm worried that my caring communication might lack credibility or I will offend. That's a great question. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a great question, actually. Um, now you kind of put that around, right? I have approached some uh, African American providers that have offended me. So, so again, and I've just kind of moved on, right? So, I, I think it's, it's important to kind of be yourself. Don't try to just be yourself and try to be somebody that you're not. That's important because people have that sense. They can see through that and just be real. And sometimes just acknowledging that you may not, you know, be familiar with the language or the culture or you may look different. But I think just kind of take that ownership that, you know, you're, you're not and, and be responsible. Be responsible. And if the client has concerns and they have a need and a question and you don't feel comfortable in answering that or you don't know how to answer that, then just say, I don't know that and I'll get back with you. And I think the other thing too in communicating, we have to be okay knowing that representation matters. Representation matters. There were there was in a recent shelter situation where a client um, was asked to um, uh, a client was asked uh, to tell his story about what had happened, and the client was very. I remember Curtis, you told me this. The client was very defiant. Nope, I'm not going to do it. But it was a it was a black man who was approached by someone that did not look like him. But when Curtis went up to him and talked to him about what he could offer by sharing his story, he agreed to do it. And I think we have to know that it's okay that I might not be the person to be the messenger. And that's okay. There there and that works in the opposite direction too where I have not been the best person to be the messenger to someone who didn't look like me. And that that is okay. And I think as Red Crosses, we need to be okay with that. To just say, I'm not equipped to handle this. I'm not equipped to handle that conversation and be okay with that. You know, Shane, and one thing that I've done too, is like, when I've gone to shelter right, a point that I make to do is that when I walk into the shelter like, for the very first time and people are there, I'm making a point to go to each person and introduce myself. You know, and let that person you know, share their story. You know, and let them talk, you know, as open and freely as they choose to. And I respond to that. Sometimes I don't respond because see, sometimes that's not what they're looking for. They just want somebody to share right. So for me, when I go to a shelter for the first time, I don't want to go in there and just sit down at the desk, you know, make sure everybody signs in or out or go set up for right. But I think part of being in the shelter is to establish a relationship because again, that first conversation really is, I think, one of the most important first things you can do to begin to establish that trust. Now, in, in Racine, <laughs> it's a little bit different, right? <laughs> My guy, I've done receipt with so much, I walked to talk to guys, hey man, what's wrong with y'all, man? What's y'all up in here? You know what I'm saying? And they would respond not. But then they knew that I had to kick in have fun and laugh and talk. But it was about getting them house notifications, come on, man, let's get it done. And they responded to that. Why? Because I had established that relationship. As a matter of fact, I almost felt like I was failing for a minute there, right? But then, uh, and they called me. They all were in the house, you know, in the house down there. And I've been the phone calls. Hey, man, we really appreciate you, Curtis, man. You know, we want to come up and hang out with you. 
as a model navigator. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the keys is we had a strong mental health presence in that shelter almost every day. Whether it was Dave or uh, uh, it was Dave and um, Deb Hammond that were just consistently there in that shelter. And when there were moments where we couldn't get something through or there were barriers that came up, they were there. There were times when I think it was um, uh, in other shelters, Paul, <laughs> our last shelter down at Holler Park. <laughs> There's this one guy that Paul could just, this is what it is, and this is what you're going to do, <laughs> and this is how it's going to be. You know, it was, and, and, and so it, that, that relationship that we have with our clients matters. Representation matters. Mm -hmm. How we approach people, it matters. And de escalating ourselves first before you approach a client in tense situations, that also matters. Taking a step back, breathing, you see a tense situation, we don't always need to call the police. Mm -hmm. We need to maybe call the, the Milwaukee County CART team to come in and respond, right? We've had them at, um, we had them at COGS. They were very helpful at COGS. We had that winter shelter open, not, not this past one, but the one before. They've, they've been to a couple of our other shelters. Is it better to call them because someone's having a mental health break if our mental health providers aren't there than calling the police? Mm -hmm. Those are the types of situations that we all need to just kind of think about. Obviously, we want people to be safe. If, if anyone's life is in danger, that's another thing. But if someone is having a mental health break, knowing that th what are those other resources that are out there that we can call for support? And do we do we have that in the shelter book though? I mean, yeah. Are those numbers available? Yeah. Just, just, no. yeah. Right. Just just because I mean, like somebody like me, if I'm sitting there, I I mean, I know a lot of people, but <laughs> I don't have all those connections. So should those be in that, those binders? Yes. I know I, I can't say that they were in these last ones. At one point, they were. Okay. They, there was, um, but we do need to get them back in there if they if they aren't. Sure. Yeah, um, they're not there right now. But I was just thinking that they do need to definitely go back. In there. Yes, and add some of those local mm -hmm. mental health resources because if somebody is having a serious mental health break, that it doesn't mean that they're going to take them, but they will come out and assess mm -hmm. and at least talk to them. Especially if our mental health providers, you know, if they are there. Um, I think there were some other questions. You know, just, just quickly, right? Uh, I was deployed uh, in Florida, right, for two weeks, right, for the hurricane. And it was a non congregate shelter, right, that I was at for two weeks, right? <clears throat> and there was a gentleman there that had uh, his parents, he was there with his parents, right? He had some severe you know, health you know, issues, right, to the point for the hotel, it's just, they got, he has to go, he has to go, right? And, and I was, like, green, I'm still green, you know, in all ways, right? And I was just seeing how those, the Red Cross volunteers were, I mean, he was stigmatized, he was demonized, he was all of that, right? And I said, you know, this just is not the way I think it should be done, right? Like, I couldn't believe it, right? And come back to Milwaukee, right? In the shelters and just kind of working and learning from, from my dad and, and Ann and all this, right? It was like the complete opposite. And that's why I'm just so, I just, I'm just so grateful to be part, you know, of working with Ann and all this, right? To see it done the right way. Because I left Florida questioning about this guy. I mean, I saw no sympathy, no empathy at all for this young man at all, you know, and um, and I had some serious conversations, you know, with individuals about that, right, and coming back to Milwaukee and the, and the region and like going up, you know, here and there and, and just seeing how it's the opposite, you know, and it, it was just uh, unbelievable, because I was in Florida, the way they handled that young man, I was about to say, I'm out of here, I can't do this if this is the way it's done. Mm -hmm. So so I feel very fortunate, you know, best to be part of this team here and in the passion and, and it's just something that uh, 
And I've been involved in a lot of things, right? A lot of initiatives, not my profits and boards, and done a whole lot, you know, but, but I think that being the debt, being part of debt, right? It's like when I'm sitting there talking to someone, you know, and then I can offer, you know, services, support, I'm making an immediate impact. I'm not part of a meeting where we meet, we meet, we meet, we meet, and you never see the outcome. But you know, it's just a feel good, it's feel good, and it's rewarding to be able to make a difference in somebody's life. And you know, talk to somebody at 3 o'clock in the morning, and to six of them in the car, and no problems, nowhere to go. You know, but see, and that's the empathy I think that, you know, I see in this room here, and, and I try to, to build my life out. You know, but, but in Florida, that was a, it was an early experience, and I think I learned a lot about what not to do and what, how not to handle those types of situations. Um, Did I get all the questions Bill, in the chat? I think. Uh, any other questions or comments from people, people online? Has anybody read this book? Evicted. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you haven't, read it. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot, and it deals with mental health, it deals with a lot of, and it is based, it's Milwaukee. It's based in Milwaukee. Right, exactly. And here's another book that I'm reading now. <laughs> this is called Madness, uh, Race, and Insanity in a Jim Crow Asylum by Antonia Hilton. She's an NBC News uh, correspondent, and I was listening to NPR the other day, and, uh, and she was promoting her book and talking about her history and her family history and how many help was in their family and how they just all lived in fear because they just knew that it was hereditary. And the big question in her family was, well, who's next, who's next, who's next? Because she had family that went to uh, to this, uh, and this is still there, it's in Maryland, right? She had family went there and they never checked out. They went there, they had one uncle that was there for over 30 years and he died there. This diagnosed the whole nine yards. So it's a wonderful read. It's called Madness, Race, and Insanity in Jim Crow Asylum. It's a phenomenal read. And it's an easy read, too, a quick read. Any other questions or comments? Is the rate of suicide uh, higher among African Americans? It's, it's, it's higher than what it has been in certain age groups. It's just increasing, particularly, like I said, in young people, in youth. Yeah, in youth particularly. Mm -hmm. Yes. How would you maybe, um, how would you suggest normalizing mental health issues so individuals would seek help? <laughs> I think that's part of the story. I think it's telling the story that it happens to everyone at some point or another. You know, at some point or another, right? So tell the story, your experience, as comfortable as you may feel in telling your story. Because if we don't tell the story, then how can we create that swell on the ground where people can begin to feel comfortable? And share those stories. That's important. I mean, I mean, I think that's really, really important. Uh, and that's like I said before. I've shared my story, you know, multiple times, and I have some other stories around mental health that I can share. But, but I think that it's just important that we talk about it and use the terms, and don't be afraid to talk about it. You don't think because you know we talk about it that we'll be looked at as being weak. We could have been my peers, my friends. But I think I talk about it from a point of strength. Having the strength and the courage to take that foot forward. And then, I mean, I've taken the foot, you know, I, I step forward, right? And I have no regrets. I have no regrets. Because, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to get back into the dark space that I was before that I have been. Because I feel like that when I'm in mean, a dark space, it has an effect, you know, on me, my family, my wife. She said that when I broke my ankle, that was the worst time of her life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I said at one point, I said, you know, Jane, 
Just put me in a room and lock the door. Turn the lights and leave me alone. I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I think just, I mean, a way, that's the way to normalize it and talk about it. Like in the book here, just share the stories. Stories are, storytelling is powerful. I love telling stories. But it's powerful, right? Because it puts a human side, of, a human touch to it. So I think we'll wrap up. Uh, oh, go ahead, Dave. So I had an experience of being a white provider uh, with an African American family. It was very distressing. And the patient was an older gentleman in his mid, mid 70s. Very serious mental health problems. Was probably not going to be able to go back home and live independently. And I was meeting with him and his three adult children. And it was a very tense meeting. Uh, it was very tense. And at one point, one of them asked me a question. And I just looked at the writing. I said, you know, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. The room just, the tension just went out of the room. The conversation was, was completely different. And I think they trusted me because I was on the ground. Right. Mm -hmm. so, that's important. Yeah, that's important. All right. Well, we are going to wrap up. Um, is Marisa on? Marisa. Marisa is our regional disaster officer. I think she's on. on. Um, Marisa, you have any words before we close out? She was no, she's not on. We have no audio. Okay, well, we Thank are, you so much. I we appreciate are done. It. Thank y'all. If you got a text from me or this match, we go with that call, Brittany. She got the numbers that want to go out. Frederico and I are not doing it. What do you want, man? I got another response from the and they said, Frederico and I are not doing it. Probably, it's probably our guy. Yeah, probably. Thank you all. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you too. <laughs> it'll be it'll be fun.